I am on. You know how I'm on. I'm on. Estoy on. Hi guys, I'm on. Ci sono. I'm on. Je suis on. I am on. My own. I'm on. Ich bin on. สวัสดีค่ะไปด้วยกันนะคะ I'm on. Estoy conectado. I'm on. Estamos on. Saya on. I'm on. Let's go. Let's be on. My name is Chris White from FruitNet Media and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Asia Briefing. Asia Briefing is our brand new series of six special broadcasts that we're putting together for you here at FruitNet to give you the lowdown on what's happening in Asia at the moment. At Asia Briefing I'm going to be joined down the line from our studio here in London with my team of expert analysts and editors who live and breathe Asia every day of the year. And of course we're going to be joined by you businessmen and women from across the world of fresh fruits and vegetables, people who deal with Asia or people who want to deal with Asia. Now today at this our fourth Asia briefing we're going to be talking about China. It's a huge market that's grown faster than any other in the last 20 years and in doing so has helped many other markets in Asia and in the rest of the world. So on today's Asia briefing we'll look at what's happening in China right now. We'll also look at how the fresh fruit and vegetable business has fared through the pandemic, which, let's not forget, started in China. And we'll also look at where China is headed next. Now, I know that's a lot to pack in in the next 60 minutes. So sit back, relax and enjoy this week's Asia Briefing. While the rest of the world remains in the grip of the pandemic, life in China seems to have largely returned to normal in the last quarter of 2020. After posting a record slump early in the year, China's economy is bouncing back. According to China's National Bureau of Statistics, GDP growth accelerated to 4.9% in the third quarter, retail sales grew by 3.3% in September, with food retail sales increasing 7.8% to almost 21 billion US dollars. While Chinese consumers are spending again, what they buy and how they buy are changing post-pandemic. With the constant reminder of COVID outbreaks around the world, Chinese consumers are still wary of crowded indoor spaces. Many are opting to buy groceries online or in stores nearby in residential areas. Financial uncertainties are prompting people to be more value conscious. They are demanding better quality, lower prices, or both. Health benefits play an important part in purchasing decisions when it comes to fruit and vegetables, and Chinese consumers rely on both Western medicine and traditional Chinese medicine for guidance. This presents opportunities for fruit categories beyond vitamin C-rich citrus products. While conventional indoor tasting is out, marketing activities are back in full swing, competing for consumers' attention. Online streaming and other digital solutions are providing marketers and brands with more tools than ever to connect with their target demographics and to tell their stories in meaningful and intimate ways. During today's Asia Briefing, 
We'll look at these new consumer trends and shifts in shopper behavior in the post-COVID China market. How are imported foods faring in China, given all the challenges with production and logistics? What products are winning Chinese shoppers over? What are the most effective ways to engage with Chinese consumers today? We'll talk to world-leading food marketers, major Chinese retailers, and market experts to find out how to succeed in China in one of the most unusual years for fresh produce trade. Now, fresh fruit imports into China have exploded since 2010 because of China's economic boom. Did you know uh, that uh, China is now the world's second largest importer of fresh fruit? Imports grew by more than 20% last year to almost 6 million tonnes. But what has happened to these import numbers since COVID started at the start of this year? Uh, to give us the lowdown, let's turn to our resident statsman, Wayne Prowse of Fresh Intelligence Consulting. The ink has hardly dried on our reports showing China's increase in fresh fruit imports to 5.8 million tonnes, or 21% growth, last year. But by midway through 2020, the picture has changed. Here we are looking at the monthly moving annual total, a measure used to measure the total 12 months of imports by month moving forward over the last five years. And we can see that it peaked last August at 5.9 million tonnes. But by August 2020, it's 5.3 million tonnes or 10% lower. The impact is even greater if we compare it to where August 2020 could have been if the projections over the last five years had continued and it would have been out to 6.5 million tonnes. Now let's have a look at tropical fruits and it's where bananas have had the greatest influence on the total result, down 7% to 1.8 million tonnes. While longans and dragon fruit have had relatively small change. Some other tropical fruits such as pineapples and mangoes have also come off high peaks last year. The largest banana suppliers, the Philippines and Ecuador, are both down around 15%, while there has been a large demand from Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia trying to fill the gap. Arguably, this has been a freight and logistics challenge. Now, temperate fruit are more pronounced, while cherries and stone fruit have actually increased. Grapes have held pretty steady, and last year's big increase in apples has not been sustained. However, citrus appears to have almost fallen off a cliff. Early in the year, coinciding with the first COVID-19 wave, Egypt was down 40% in their supply, and Spain was down 90%. Again, logistics was a challenge. The United States lifted 12%, although this is not to anywhere near the level it was a few years ago. Now, at this time, only early results for the southern season, for about the third of the southern season, we see that South Africa and Australia are both down significantly, while Chile has just entered the market for the first time. Now, not all markets in Asia are trending the same way. The monthly moving annual total for Japan, for example, has hardly changed. But we'll leave that for another time. At the height of the pandemic, we held a special online event all about China. How the China market is changing under COVID was at the heart of my discussion with Ng Kok Hui of Zespri China and Mark Tanner of China Skinny. Now let's remind ourselves what they had to say. We've heard from many other um, of our speakers uh, today at Fruit Note Live China all about the shift to e-commerce. And that e-commerce shift is something that hasn't just been 
about the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has certainly accentuated that. For you at, uh, at Zespri, how important is this, uh, as it were, this e-commerce channel? And, and how does it change the way in which you market to your consumers? Because, you know, for, for us in, in, in uh, Western Europe, for me here in the UK, it's all about that communication at the point of sale. In China, it's quite different for you, isn't it? Yeah, so you're right. This shift towards e-commerce has been happening even before the pandemic. But post-COVID, what we've seen is the trend has just accelerated. So some consumers during the lockdown that was happening started trying out e-commerce and some of the behavior has just stuck as they continue with e-commerce. What we've also seen is also a boom in the O2O business along with e-commerce. So just for perspective, e-commerce accounts for close to 20% of our business. And we've been seeing really strong double-digit growth in the e-commerce space post the COVID pandemic here in China. So definitely it looks like the trend is here to stay and it's going to be further accelerated. So your second part of the question was how has that shift and how we reach these consumers um, with this shift in channel behavior. What has been very interesting in this e-commerce space is it removed that whole physical barrier that we used to know where we start to think of as, as a physical store, but now everything is online. It allows us to immediately see conversion or the impact of any marketing campaigns we do via our e-commerce retailers. And what we've done actually post the pandemic is we started shifting some of our media spending towards digital as consumers start to move into an online space and also linking it to our e-commerce retailers where we can measure the conversion of this media spending much better than previous traditional media touch points. And, and when you talk about uh, the shift to digital, is it all then about this? It's all about shifting to the mobile phone, is it? So, well, mobile phone, definitely apps for a lot of it, but not just that, also all to all channels. So the line between offline and online is just blurry. You could actually go to an offline store and have it deliver. You can go to a Walmart, but have it deliver to your store. You can go to a Walmart app and then have it deliver to your home. So that O to O channel, the line, the physical demarcation is blurring. So what we are really saying is obviously e-commerce as on the mobile phone or your pure e-commerce players, we're also seeing a boom in O2O where these retailers like a Herma have both physical stores, they also have online stores. And then products and grocery are delivered to your home. But, but then uh, that, that, as it were, communication point, as I said a moment ago, the communication with me here in London is kind of at the retail point of sale. That's where the retailer kind of communicates to me. They don't communicate to me via a mobile phone. In China, you're making that communication very much through the mobile phone. And the retailer, or rather the consumer, I don't need to be at the retail point of sale because the retail point of sale can exist here just as much as it can exist in the store. But the, de the development of O2O, of that offline to online, how do you manage that in the store itself and how is that changing when i go in physically into a into a home house store for example how are you communicating with me there so what we've also done is we're working with a lot of these e-commerce players to ensure that we are also communicating with consumers in their app because be it whether you're in a physical store or in the online store you will be assessed via the app mm. in your mobile phone so we definitely ensure that we are communicating within the app we are also channeling a lot of our media spending into online TV, online um, digital sites and KOLs, KOCs, and we drive traffic into our e-commerce stores. And then that allows conversion to happen. So it's very different. It's a different path to purchase altogether. This is the olden days when we think of consumers' path to purchase. It's very linear. There is awareness, there is consideration, there's selection, and finally repeat, which is a very linear path to purchase. In the world today, consumers have a very non-linear path to purchase. At any one point, because of the e-commerce or the app on their phone, they could jump from awareness into purchase instantly. 
they can jump from engagement with some of your key opinion leaders blog into purchase directly as long as there's a link to bring them into the app into the e-commerce stores so it's no longer where we used to think of okay here's my point of sale i'm communicating here's a call to action for you to buy but it's no longer that way it's in all our communication consumers are able to jump into conversion and uh, you, you mentioned about the the amount of data you're able to harvest as a result of uh, of, of the online uh, of you being very active in the online space um, tell us a little bit about some of the data that kind of came up during this pandemic all of a sudden that you were, were perhaps surprised by or not surprised by. Uh, did you get what, what kind of readings did you get or what kind of information did you get from your consumers um, during this period? Was it was it a huge focus there for them on these health concerns about wellness? Uh, I spoke to your chief executive, uh, Dan Matheson, a few weeks back on my on my podcast, Fruitbox, and he was telling me about this whole interest in wellness has been a big uplift yeah. for sales for, for, for Zespri Kiwi Fruit. Yes. So clearly, post the pandemic, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier as well, we saw a huge surge in interest behind vitamin C and immunity. And I think what has really been working for us, which we've been really fortunate, is we have been constantly communicating the health properties of Zespri Kiwi Fruits. It's been something that's we've been, we've been doing consistently in the market for years. And during this pandemic, we increased the spotlight and the limelight and the focus on communicating the vitamin C properties of kiwi fruits. And that's allow us to help consumers understand the benefit of this in line with their desire for greater vitamin C and hence immunity. So definitely there is an increased demand for health more so than before, but that trend was actually present before. Consumers have always been concerned about health, increasingly more so in China. But obviously post the pandemic, we're seeing a huge surge in interest and definitely far more accelerated than before. Let's, let's bring in now our um, other panelist uh, today, uh, Mark Tanner. Mark is the managing director of a, a company called China Skinny that... Uh, spends its time analyzing what Chinese consumers are doing from your offices uh, in, in Shanghai as well, Mark, but you're, I know, based in, in New Zealand for the, for the time being and heading back to Shanghai, I hope, I hope very soon. Um, uh, we just heard from uh, Kok Hui there a moment ago about this, uh, this interest that uh, Chinese consumers have for imported, uh, well, actually for quality, and the, the perception always was that quality equals imported, but now quality can also equal domestically grown uh, product, uh, local production. Uh, are you seeing that? Are you detecting that? Yeah, it's definitely not specific to um, fruit. There's some categories where it's much more so, such as smartphones. Everyone wants a Huawei now, not an Apple. But, but fruit has definitely been impacted. Um, overall, fruit's probably one of the better um, performing products for imported because one, there's a lot of new and novel fruit that you don't get from Chinese um, brands. And two, there is still that association with clean um, health standards and, and uh, process that is a lot safer. As I, as I asked uh, Kokwe a, mo a moment ago, that, that the kind of numbers that you were detecting or the things that, are, that, that were coming through your research during the pandemic, uh, were there things there that... that you kind of that stood out for you that were gee i'd never expected that or uh or or stuff that you just were surprised by yeah i think one of the more interesting ones is as kokwe was saying a lot of the trends were already happening but they just accelerated up a few gears so if you look at e-commerce for example it went from being pretty saturated in in that millennial market and all of a sudden, all these older people came on and all these consumers in lower tier cities. So if you look at those aged over 30, which is considered old in China, um, that grew from about 49 to 60% of, of the, the market. And similarly, tier three and, and later cities, um, that grew from uh, 57 to 70%. So massive change. And, and with that you different dynamic in shopping. A lot of these guys are much less mature. The way they shop, um, they're not as confident online, so you need to cater for that. 
and a lot of them are much more price sensitive. So you, you need to kind of almost have a two-pronged strategy for those that were shopping a lot and, and the millennials beforehand versus these newbies uh, to online. Mm-hmm. Um, never really I, I, you, you've reassured me because every time I go to China, I'm now called Lao Bai, which is old man white. Uh, <laughs> I think myself, I'm not terribly old, but in, if, if, if 30 is uh, old, then I'm certainly uh, the wrong side of 30, sadly. Um, but but this issue about um, about how consumers have reacted has changed. A, a friend of mine told me recently that it takes kind of six days to change your habits of a lifetime, as it were. And and curiously enough, the you know the the, the isolation that all of us, all of us have been through, and this global event has been one where we're all experiencing essentially the same kind of uh, the same kind of thing for about sixty days. That people then. Do change their habits. They do do things differently. Um, the 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 things that you've seen happening in China in this period, uh, which ran, I guess, from January to let's say April, uh, uh, May, for for the Chinese consumer. Do you detect there that there are some kind of habits that have changed and that and are, and are there to stick, that they will stay? Yeah. And I'll ask this of Kokui as well. Or do you think that they'll kind of you know? They'll get back to the back to the normal, or will they move to a next normal, as it were? That's a good question. I know a lot of consumers still love going to the shop and going to the wet market and, and socialising, particularly the older that have come online. But something we have seen, and, and you saw it with the big uh, shopping festival six one eight um, late la- or early last month, the fastest growing category was um, groceries. And the third fastest growing category was kitchen appliances, which shows a couple of, of those big trends that have happened. I'm sure you've been hearing about today. There's one, people are buying groceries. They've got into the habit. They've got over those initial pain points and lack of confidence, and they're continuing. They're like, hey, I like this. Let's keep doing it. Mm-hmm. And the other is, is they are spending more time at home. They're investing in their homes. So they're buying appliances mm-hmm. and they're cooking at home. A lot of them are more confident now and more aware in the way they cook. We uh, track a lot of categories and, and things like fine wine for home has gone up. Things like cream has gone way up. You see, that's related to uh, to to f- uh, food as well um, and fruit. You can you can throw a nice bit of fruit with some cream and do some pretty good baking. Um, but it, it's also about beauty, um, and and that really relates back to to the plumpness or, or whatever. And um, beauty is a big big industry in China and. and increasingly inner beauty related to diet and things is is um, playing a part. So you're seeing more and more marketing communications related to that beauty angle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think we've lost uh, the line to Shanghai. So uh, I'll, I'll continue with you, Mark, uh, on a stronger line down to uh, New Zealand where you are at the moment. Um, the, the issue of uh, kind of social media influences, it was one of the questions I was trying to ask of Kok Hui. Do you think that the focus there is going to be on a kind of different type of influence so that you're going to want to use? Is it going to be about much more about health and nutrition or is it going to be about fitness and uh, and sport and so on? Oh, we've got Kokui back, I think, now. Uh, Mark? Yes, I'm back. Great, Good nice to, to see you, you back. Mark, you answer that question and I'll come to you, Kokui, if I may. Yeah, so it's it's... It all comes down to your positioning and, and your angle and really understanding what, what your target market wants. But something that we saw a lot come out of the, the lock, lock-in was people really had a lot of time to reflect and, and um, their own purpose and what's important to them and also what brands they want to engage with and, and purchase from and advocate. So that's, that's become a really big thing and, and a way to associate with that purpose, whether it be sustainability, whether it be fitness, um, whether it be doing good for the world, um, that really comes down or can be supported by the key opinion leaders or the influences that you engage with. Uh, Kokui, I, d- I don't know whether um, you heard my question. I was asking about uh, the kind of nature of social media influences. And I know that they're very important, well, all over the world, but kind of almost especially so, in, in your market in China, uh, where you yep. work now, um, are you taking a different attitude to, or are you looking for different types of social media influences these days? Before it was always about, it seemed to me, you know, beauty and health, or, you know, looking good and having the latest fashions and using the latest products. Is it now much more about 
you know, eat this because it's good for you and a doctor tells you it's good for you? So we work with a few different kinds or different groups of influencer here in China. And obviously, um, many of us have heard about the fan economy here in China. We've got lots of supporters who support different niche of key influencers. For us this year, because we've launched also a brand new global identity for our brand with the proposition on make your healthy irresistible, one of the key objectives is how can we challenge consumers' conventional belief in health? We used to think that when things are healthy, they must taste terrible. So there's always this choice and trade-off between health and pleasure. But we know it's not true. We know now with all the fresh produce we can get, you get the best of both worlds. And that's what we really want to do. We want to challenge that view of health and pleasure is a mutually exclusive game. So we're really glad this year to work with some of the influencer like Zhu Ting, the national team volleyball and uh, national volleyball team captain here, because while obviously she's a very unifying figure, you know, in this her national pride coming out of the pandemic, she's a very unifying force and figure. But on top of that, she represents this new view of health, this new view of you know she's enjoying doing playing volleyball. She does it really well. She's making great achievements, but it's not at the expense of suffering. It's not. She's enjoying it, and likewise, her view on health. This is not about trading off and compromising. It's、mm-hmm. about enjoying healthy.、And、I think she's been able to tell the story for us. I'm、um, through some of the contents we've been able to generate with her. She's been able to tell our brand story, humanize our brand proposition in a way that no, you know, advertising, just very ad type advertising kind of material could do. So that's one, and. Another group of influencers we work with, as you've seen, is Dr. Ding Xiang in China. They、mm-hmm. are a platform of healthcare professionals and dietitians, and they have gained a lot of credibility during the pandemic period for a lot of the advice and advisories they were able to give on during the lockdown period. And we've been able to work with them to talk about some of the myth busting、um, of health and how can you. Eat healthy, live healthy, and enjoy living healthy, because that's ultimately is what it is. You want to enjoy leading a healthy life.、Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of different groups of influencers we work with in those space, each achieving different objectives. There is the credentialing objective. There is also the brand storytelling objective, so we can connect more emotionally with our consumers.、Mm-hmm. So things have certainly moved on since we had that conversation at Fruitnet Live China、uh, last July. In fact, China is recovering very fast. For an insight into the consumer and retail trends, we spoke to China's leading fresh produce e-tailer Ben Lai.、Uh, my colleague Fruitnet's Jennifer Zhang, based in Shanghai, spoke to Jason Chen, general manager of Ben Lai's merchandise center, about how China has been recovering in recent months. Now Jennifer also wanted to know how the pandemic has changed the consumer market in China,、uh, as well, of course, uh, 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 how it's changed the market for fresh fruits and vegetables more generally. Yes, I think for the pandemic, it will be affected by the impact on consumers. Besides the impact on consumers, it will also be affected by the impact on the market. For example, for consumers, their needs will be more targeted to health-related products. For example, we can see very clearly that apples and apples have been in decline in the exports and exports. 它同比是供大于求，是有下跌的。但是对于梨梨类，就是非常明显的是是是需求大于供给，所以整体的梨类的价格各方面都是明显要好于那个苹果。那么我相信当这当中可能会有消费者对于因为新冠更多的是从肺部从呼吸道进去对它影响。那么梨类从中国的传统观观念来说，梨类是对呼吸道、对肺是有一个清肺作用的。那么这这种东西，其实在整个消费者的一个消费过程当中，它都是会
有这种逐步的一些影响，大家会对健康类的水果会会更更受欢迎。那除了这个以外呢，其实我觉得可能市场上面的影响会更大一些，因为。总总体来说，中国的高端的水果市场原先是大量的是进口水果，那么现在受新冠整个疫情的一个一个影响呢，国外有很多疫情控制不是很好，所以它的水果采摘、包装、生产都大受影响。除了这个以外呢，就是整体全球的运输，无论是海运，无论是空运，其实整整体的运力都是大受影响。那么对于进口水果来说，它的这个市场一定是会让出很多的空间，或者说更多的空间给到国产的高端的水果。那么国，我觉得国国国产的一些高端水果可能会有更多的一些机会。呃，我觉得一定有，呃，因为这个可能。跟整体就是全球的一个经济环境，包括这次疫情带来的一些不确定性，都会对消费者的心理预期，或者说对他的一些购买的决策选择会有一些影响。那么，我觉得顾客会更加理智，更加就是他在选择呃消费商品或者像水果这这种这种，虽然也是一个刚需，但是水果它是有一些非常明显的彼此的替代。呃，我觉得对于平价的果蔬来说，那还是价格决定一切，就是性价比是一个绝对的，全起到制定性作用的。那么对于中高端的来说呢，那么还是对于你的品质，还有这对于这种水果是不是比较新的一些开发的一些也好的品种啊，一些新新研发的一些好的那个。那个那个品类，那个对顾客会有比较大的一些吸引。其实，本来生活网今年整个中秋季的一个消费，尤其在水果上面，跟去年基本是一个持平的。这个跟前几个月。还是有点不不同。前几个月我们是有一些下跌的，但是这一季中秋季呢，我们基本是跟去年是一个持平状态。那么，但是它的里面的结构其实是发生了蛮大的一个变化。那么我们原先是进口水果，呃，尤其像新西兰的苹果啊，像那个那个美国的那个橙子啊，像这一些澳洲的橙子，像这一些我们原先占比是非常大的。那么今年呢？其实有一个非常明显的，就是国产的，尤其梨类，尤其葡萄类，是是替代了进口水果的一个下下跌，而且非常明显，这个比例应该是不小了。目前水果的市场，呃，线下的影响可能是比线上会更明显更大。疫情下面对线上是有一些红利的，呃，但是对线下的冲击会大一点。但是整体呢，又又会受到整个就经济的一个一个下行的，或者说不确定因素的影响，所以整体呢都是有一个偏向。那么，其实中国确实是一个非常大的市场，竞争也是非常非常大的。所以在中国呢，现在在这种经济不确定性还有疫情之下呢。我觉得就是说，有实力的、准备更充分的，而且就是说，它在无论在性价比或者在它的品质特点上面，是有一个明显的优势。在这样的一些供应商，我相信它还是会对中国市场有有对它有更大的吸引力，或者有更更大的成长空间。但是如果在性价比上面，或者在品质特点上面，没有你自己的。一个一个绝对的优势的话呢，呃，在中国其实是一个一个绝对的红海，这个市场竞争会非常非常激烈。So let's conclude with a look at where the consumer market is heading in China. How has shopper behaviour in China changed during the pandemic? 
and how will it shape the market in future? Jerry Claude is a consumer research specialist who specializes in interviewing Chinese consumers in Chinese. His company is called The Solution and it's helped a number of global fresh produce brands to launch their products in China. In a moment, Asia Fruits Deputy Editor Matt Jones talks to Jerry Claude about what makes for effective marketing in China after the pandemic. But let's, let's first hear from Jerry about the latest trends and the future outlook for China. Hi, my name's Jerry Claude. I'm delighted to be speaking to the Asia Fruit community today. Before I get started on today's topic, which will be about three key questions about Chinese consumer mindset post-COVID, I just wanted to introduce or reintroduce myself. From the image here, you'll see this is pretty much uh, a key part of my life and career. That is interviewing Chinese consumers in Chinese and possibly one of the only non-Chinese researchers to be doing this in Chinese language itself. Basically, my role is to be incredibly nosy to understand, first of all, key responses from consumers, but also to observe what is going on in their day-to-day -day life. So to understand what, the, what, what are they doing that's different? How are things changing? What are the gaps? What are the key opportunities which I can expose and help my clients leverage in this context? Now, people might know me from uh, previous presentations that I've given at Asia Fruit Logistica. Two years ago, I presented with the team from Avanza about launching New Zealand avocado in China for its first official season. Now, what I did in this regard was conduct deep level consumer research, but also the very important task of creating a unique Chinese name for the brand so that uh, New Zealand avocado could stand out in what was an increasingly cluttered market. Also last year, I presented a couple of insight sessions, including the case study of Rocket Apples, which I had worked with very closely, um, particularly to understand uh, the needs of young Chinese families. And as a result of this research, Rocket launched a campaign based on Children's Day, which was awarded with Campaign of the Year last year. So I was very proud to be part of that. Due to COVID, I'm not actually able to travel to China at the moment due to various restrictions, but I am continuing my interviews via WeChat in a form of digital ethnography. And I'm delighted to say that the insights that I'm getting are uh, just as valuable as I would if I was doing this in a face-to-face basis because Chinese consumers are just so comfortable using their phones to respond to questions. So this has been a little bit of a revelation as a result of this period. Now to the topic of today, um, the team at Asia Fruit have sent me three questions which they wanted me to briefly answer before we go into Q&A. Now, the first one is really, are consumer trends that formed and or accelerated over the pandemic period here to stay? My simple response to this is that there were already very important trends that had began before COVID essentially came in to accelerate them. So essentially like an old recorder, pushing that fast forward button, it sort of accelerated things that were already happening. Now the key uh, trend that was accelerated in this period is a premium perspective on food and its connection to health. So what Chinese consumers, particularly premium consumers, were increasingly doing was creating a subset of foods where they would not compromise. So they would not buy cheaper products and they would tend to invest in these categories to ensure that they and their families were receiving the very best. They identified these groups of products as ones in which they could derive profound benefits around preventative health in terms of vitality, in terms of quality of living. Now, the good news, which uh, segues nicely into our second question, is that food and produce 
were very much part of that subset that Chinese consumers were creating. Now, should we be optimistic about the post-COVID period in China? A simple, question, a simple response once again is absolutely. The reason is that while Chinese consumers are weary, this weariness is driving demand for premium food products. Now, the example that I have here in this image is recent research that I've been doing for supplement brands. And this young woman, this is probably a smaller, <laughs> smaller group of supplements compared to the other consumers I had interviewed who would have up to 15 to 20 products in this category. Now, what is important for us as fruit and produce brands is that the mentality around supplements, that is the idea of investing in one's health and vitality, is now extended to our category. So I would argue previously for fruit and produce, it was very much around natural, healthy snack. But now people are looking at fruit and produce as a key part of their scientific or rational diet. So the mindset with fruit and produce is essentially the same as supplements, which is very, very good because this is considered a premium category in which consumers are willing to invest. Now, how do we take advantage of this? Now, when I look at the different sub-generations in China, um, I see that apart from our post zero zeros, post zero zeros are early Gen Z, who have never actually experienced recession in their young lives. So they have very much hit the panic button. So they're kind of engaged what I've called revenge saving. But across the board from early millennials right up to emergent category, uh, emergent cohort of silvers, you see various mindsets uh, emerging. Selective premium, quality driven, lifestyle driven, experience driven, and savoring moments. So these are the key expectations which are essentially driving demand in our specific category. Now what this points to is that while we need to tick boxes around functional benefits, we must extend our marketing to include emotive, aspirational cues. So one of the key things that we must do as an industry is move from commodity trading to brand creation. Very, very important. Uh, you can count on your hands how the number of established fruit brands in China. Now, I would love to see that move from around six to around 30 in the next two to three years. Now that leads to my final point, which is how can we take advantage of these various, uh, this new mindset, so this idea of premiumization, investment in preventative health. One of the things that I'm noticing from Chinese consumers is that they are using digital media and other forms of self-research to understand the background about brands. This is a natural reaction to COVID where they have kind of lost confidence in various categories. So how do you alleviate that, that sense of mistrust? You do this by trying to create a more personal connection to the brand. So who is behind the brand? What is their philosophy? Where does this brand come from? They're really searching for a more significant backstory. Now, why is this so important in China? Because once consumers have reached that threshold of trusting, gaining that sense of assurance from brands, then they are very likely to share that on their social media networks because it has essentially 
tick the box and it has meant that this brand has fallen into a premium subset of brands which essentially premium consumers lock in. It's, a, it's almost like a sense of status. Once uh, consumers have that sense of trust, then this ladders up to a profound sense of loyalty and the idea that the product and brand actually has strong symbolism of what it means to be in the middle class. Uh, thank you. I look forward to questions covering quite a lot in just 10 minutes. Well, thanks for joining us, Jerry, and for that presentation you've just delivered. Uh, as has been mentioned, my name's Matt Jones, the uh, Deputy Editor of Asia Fruit Magazine, and uh, I'm here to ask Jerry a few questions. Now, Jerry, as you mentioned, the demand for premium food products will only grow in China over the coming years. I'd be interested to get your thoughts on where imported products sit within this premium mix. Will imported fruit and vegetable lines still be seen as a high watermark for quality, or are domestically grown products gaining ground in the eyes of Chinese consumers? Well, it's a good question, Matthew. One of the things that people may see coming out of China at the moment is a lot of vlogging farmers. So people selling apples and other forms of produce. And there has been a spike in an interest with domestic products in this area, kind of part of a recovery program from the government, but also, of course, the lack of availability, a logistic uh, shortfall in this period. But I think to directly answer this question, I would say that foreign imported produce brands will still dominate this area. The reason I say this is whenever I'm doing primary consumer research, so in the homes out shopping with Chinese consumers, they are always talking to me. Um, and the thing is, they will reveal this to me as a foreigner. They probably would not reveal this to a Chinese researcher because it's a little bit sensitive. Premium consumers are very concerned about soil pollution. On their social media feeds, they are seeing terrible images of seepage and pollution, pollutants in the soil, general ecological imbalance caused by overconstruction, over farming. Now, they know this. It's not to say that they wouldn't experiment and sort of buy domestic brands kind of as a treat or around a festival, but consistent consumption will still lie with international brands. But there is a key responsibility for international brands in this space, which I'll talk to uh, with the other questions, which is really about moving from commodities to brands. In the post-COVID period, as I mentioned in my presentation, consumers are really wanting to understand the backstory, the philosophy, the inspiration, the production values of the very pricey imported fruit and produce they're buying. So it's our responsibility to meet consumers halfway there. But I do believe that benchmark or watermark will still be foreign because there is not the sufficient trust in terms of soil and ecological conditions to support quality produce in China. And just picking up on that point around the need to transition from commodity trading to brand creation, in your eyes, is it realistic to think that 20 to 30 highly recognisable fresh produce brands could be trading in China within the next two or three years? Yeah, I would say two or three. I might hedge my bets and say three to five because I realised that was probably the big call that I made in the presentation. Why I am confident, well, there are two things. The first one is that it is still surprising that fruit and produce is still largely an unbranded category. Despite 30 to 40 years of economic development and market capitalism in China, still there are major, major gaps in terms of the idea of branded products. Now, there is a reason why this might have occurred with fruit and produce because it is very seasonal. So sometimes businesses would think, well, I need to kind of do some tactical stuff when my fruit is in market, but I don't see wider value in promoting and investing in a brand 
all year round in China. So there has been sort of, there are some brands well known that we, we know, established brands, but overall the category still has major, major gaps. Now, when the category has gaps, we need to turn that around, flip it upside down and say that is a major opportunity for us as an industry, as international imported brands to move from that idea as a seasonal commodity and build this into a full brand. And what I mean by brand is creating a personal connection to the end consumer, to their family, and to their wider aspirations. So this idea of moving beyond transaction to ensuring that your product is an important part of locals' lifestyle, their day-to-day -day routine. Mm. And should suppliers from all countries and regions be looking at brand creation in China then? Yes, I think actually there is an opportunity right across our global industry. Now, obviously, each nation or each region is understood in slightly different terms in China. Now, many of my US clients have said to me, well, isn't this a, isn't this a bad time for us to be promoting ourselves in China? And I'm saying, don't worry, because in terms of the brand image of the United States, it is well and truly the most positive in China. People gravitate to the US in terms of being a leading nation, in terms of its influential popular culture, and they have strong, uh, they have strong levels of belief around the US production and manufacturing uh, abilities. Now, so for the US, what that requires is really looking at the specific associations that Chinese consumers make to the US and leveraging them from the perspective of your own brand. In Australia and New Zealand, using a, another part of the world, we need to uh, be talking about our natural advantages at a more profound level. So the fact that we are small nations with less, less, less dense populations, we can talk about what are pro producing regions, why they are unique and special and arguably more pure. Uh, for our friends in the community in South America, I would say the biggest challenge is actually to create stronger visibility amongst Chinese consumers because while they may know South America generally, they do not know nations specifically. So I would encourage clients from that area of the world to really think how they can talk about their specific region or their specific approach to horticulture, to production. So to answer your question, Matthew, I think it's all to play for. It's just that each region will approach this transition from commodity to brand in a different way, which leverages their own unique and distinctive advantages. And that sort of feeds into my final uh, question here. You mentioned the need for brands to develop a more personal connection with Chinese consumers. Can you elaborate on how the companies behind successful brands are, all, are already doing this? The key is that these brands have been able to connect with lifestyle. So it's not just about immediate gratification or consumption of that good. It is what that product represents as a symbol, what it says about the individual consumer. Now, to give you a, a somewhat obvious example is the success of Starbucks in China. Why have they been so successful? They have a sense not just about the product or the coffee, it's the idea that they have come to represent a certain aspiration or way of living. In some ways, Zespri, arguably one of the most well-known produce brands in China, what they have done is connected with this idea of being a progressive parent. So it's not just about eating kiwi fruit, it's what being a Zespri consumer means in terms of your social status, in terms of your self-identity. So the key thing of moving from a commodity to a brand is the idea of moving beyond the idea of transaction and connecting to wider lifestyle aspirations. 
this is particularly important in China because society is moving, society econ in the economy is moving so quickly. So naturally people feel a little unstable with all this change. What they're wanting brands to do is to provide that level of surety, almost like an anchor in their day to day, help them to create progressive and healthy routines. If a brand is able to achieve this, so to connect meaningfully with lifestyle, then people essentially embed that brand into their lifestyle and they're proud about what that means to them and ultimately are happy to share that with other people. So it becomes a lifestyle standard or a symbol for living a good life. So that's really uh, the target that... Uh, um, our, it's basically this is sort of the objective that brands need, uh, need to be aiming for in China and what we call this is the idea of an exemplar brand and what that means is it becomes a behavior that other people aspire to so that when people think about apples they think about a particular brand or experience when they think about avocado they would do the same. They would connect the idea or that behavior with a specific brand. So that's kind of what we're what what uh, businesses need to achieve: creating that relevance on a day-to-day -day basis and creating that idea of routine. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Jerry. And it's uh, back to the studio. Welcome to Asia Fruit Logistica on. It's the fantastic new digital platform for you to do business in Asia this season. Register, log in, then click on any of the four buttons to find out more. Explore is our welcome page. It's full of recommendations of people you need to meet and events you need to attend. Our algorithm uses your profile and your activity on the platform to suggest what's best for you. Content is where you see the full program of Asia Fruit Congress on, every single hall forum, and all the presentations by our exhibitors. There's a lot going on. Meet is where your networking and your business meetings happen. It's at the heart of our platform. It's right where you need to be. My Schedule is your personalized timetable of all your meetings and events. Meet. Let's have a closer look at how to schedule your meetings. There are two ways to schedule your meetings. Option one, under For You, you see the people our algorithm suggests you really should meet. To request a meeting, simply click on the Meet button and submit your request. It's as easy as that. Option two, search for who you want to meet by company, people, product or national pavilion. Choose the presenter you want to meet and send your meeting request. Simple. Under company, a detailed company profile, product image, video and the main presenters appear here. Our personal concierge follows up closely to increase the meeting confirmation rate. Your personal agenda is updated automatically. Meetings only take place with both parties' consent. As an exhibitor, you can start placing your requests from early October. At the designated meeting time on the 18th to the 20th of November, a video meeting takes place with one simple click. Our chat and video function are also working around the clock to take account of the time differences. Want to exhibit? Here are our three exhibitor packages. On Business. On Business is our entry-level package. It includes three media products with either video and product images. You can have two company representatives assigned as presenters in the platform and each can schedule up to 30 meetings over three days. That's up to 60 meetings per company. Simple, effective and affordable, On Business is the perfect solution for those getting started in Asia. On Premium, suitable for a larger team. On Premium offers up to six media products of either video or product image and six company presenters, and each presenter can schedule up to 36 meetings over three days. That's more than 200 meetings per company. 
On Premium also provides a rotating banner under Meet and includes upranking of your company and presenter profiles. It means your details are profiled under Meet. On Corporate On Corporate offers maximum exposure with up to 14 media products of either video or product image and maximum 20 presenters with an unlimited number of meetings. All the upranking features and rotating banner from On Premium plus a 20-minute presentation on content. Special for this year is that all exhibitors can get free access to Asia Fruit Congress On. Our visitor pass costs 34 euros per person and grants access to Asia Fruit Congress On, hall forums and unlimited meetings with exhibitors. Visitors with a voucher code get to register for free. Register now at Asia Fruit Logistica On. It's where the fresh produce business in Asia meets. Let's be on. See you in November. OK, that's all for today's Asia Briefing. More fascinating stuff from the team at FruitNet, I'm sure you'll agree. Tune in at the same time next week for our next Asia Briefing. And if you can't make it live, then don't forget it's all there to view on demand when you want. Check it out on our platform for Asia Fruit Logistica on, uh, or you go to asiafruitlogistica.com and, in fact, asiafruitcongress.com. Thanks for watching. Zaijian, goodbye. My name is Laura Martin, and I'm in charge of subscriptions at FruitNet. I want to tell you about FruitNet's new digital magazines. They are free to download, and they offer a range of news, interviews, and industry analysis. You can access them online to read them live, or download them to read them later. They work on your smartphone, your tablet, and your computer. If you subscribe already, just go to the App Store Google Play or Desktop to download the app. If you want to become a subscriber, please get in touch. Email me on subscriptions at fruitnet.com. In the meantime, this is a short video that explains how the app works. It's really easy. So give it a try and happy reading! Asia Fruit has recently launched its new digital magazine. You can now read your favourite fresh produce business magazine and catch up on the latest news via your smartphone or tablet device. The new app allows you to share stories within your network and has a handy search function to filter news you're looking for. You can also download new and previous editions of Asia Fruit to read them offline. All Asia Fruit subscribers have access to the new Asia Fruit app and if you do not have a subscription, contact our team today to organise one. The new user-friendly digital edition has been created by the same people behind apps developed for The Economist, The Independent and other leading publications. So don't wait any longer, Asia Fruit app is now available to download free from the App Store and Google Play.
This is a story about dedication, about respect for nature and for people, about colleagues, partners, entrepreneurial spirit, seeds and vegetables. This is a story about sharing opportunities for growth and a healthy future. Growth forms the basis of life. Growth is in our genes. It creates chances. Opens up worlds. New requirements, new tastes, new consumers. But growth brings challenges too. Or are they opportunities? Healthy growth is linked to sharing. Sharing expertise, knowledge, and inspiration. Sharing a passion for Mother Nature and all she produces. Sharing the future. Growing populations and diminishing natural resources are just some of the challenges faced by growers today. As one of the richest sources of vitamins and minerals, producing healthy, tasty, and affordable vegetables in an environmentally friendly way has never been more important. At Syngenta Vegetable Seeds, we are committed to supporting the people who work tirelessly to feed the world, now and in the future. Our seeds have improved resistance and adaptability and bring longer shelf life, unrivaled quality, nutrition, and flavor. We're anticipating the changing needs of our world with 30 crop species and over 2,500 varieties. It's a commitment in every seed. Through close partnerships and local dialogue, we put growers at the heart of everything we do developing solutions that address their unique challenges and needs. It's our dedication to unmatched quality and the expertise of our people that makes this possible. 2,300 employees in over 50 countries dedicated to the pursuit of best-in-class produce. At our world-leading R&D sites, trialing stations, and facilities across the globe, we work with farmers, academia, and environmental groups to unlock genuine value through innovation, bringing new varieties to market that address disease, changing climates, and evolving consumer demands. Every day, we're making a real world difference, transforming how crops are grown and enabling growers to sustainably and responsibly make better use of resources.